We have a cat on this on this site. We don't know. We can control dogs, but we can't control cats, apparently. <laughs> well, this is one of the most difficult tasks I've ever had because I'm researching myself. I'm researching where the poetry in me came from. So it means going back. What I've learned is that in the genre of poetry, there's traditions that develop, and you can't ignore them. You integrate them to a certain extent, but you also resist them to a certain extent. And it's that resisting and accepting that starts to create your own voice. And that unique voice that's you. And any time I run a poetry workshop, I try to convince people they have a unique voice. And it's such a pleasure when you start sensing that you're speaking with that unique, just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you unique. We are unique. We have a unique adoration, a unique utterance. I feel we can only talk about so much how these poems were written because without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His grace and His presence and His generosity, they would never have been written. And one of the reasons I know that is because if I try to go back and write them again, there's no way. The door was open and the door was closed. They were for a period of time, 40 days. And afterwards, I couldn't go back. But somehow, my life as a writer and as a poet went into that book. And that's what I want to talk about. Who was I? Can you imagine me leaving here? Going back 1973, arriving by a ship, as young as you men out here, getting off the Limatov ship that sank in 1982. I loved it. Coming across the Atlantic Ocean on a ship, standing at the bow before people worried if you're going to fall off or not, seeing the ship dive into the waves and come up again and down and up and down and up. Take me across the Atlantic Ocean, up the St. Lawrence River, across Lake Ontario, to a marsh-pocketed shore 50 miles from Niagara Falls, 25 years of age, deciding to get on a ship and travel 3,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean. See me there as a young man, as a boy. For a while, my grandparents and my mom and dad, my grandparents on my mother's side, we all lived together in the same house. And I was a toddler, upstairs. And my grandfather was downstairs in his cabinet-making workshop with all the fumes. And I loved it, getting under the table and throwing the shavings from the planes over me. You know what I mean? All these shavings, just like kids throw leaves over themselves. I was throwing shavings over myself. I loved it. But what was he doing? He was reciting poetry to me. Before I went to school at five, he was reciting poetry to me. He was reciting 19th century merit narrative poetry that he knew by heart, like The Pied Piper of Hamelin by Robert Browning, uh, Lady of Shalott by Tennyson, Marmion by Sir Walter Scott, The Lady of the Lake by Sir Walter Scott, and also Horatio at the Bridge by a poet not so well known now, Macaulay. Horatio defending Rome against the Vandals attacking the city. And he's pouring out these romantic narratives 
and also beautifully the Owl King by Goethe, where the son, the boy, is on the back of a horse and the father is galloping and galloping through the woods trying to get to a, his boy to a place where he can be healed. And the boy says, I hear the Owl King behind me. The Owl King is the king of death. And the boy is describing this creature chasing them down the, through the woods. I was absolutely spellbound. All this was being fed into me. And my dad and mum were just as interesting because my dad, from the Second World War, long-term Canadian, Canadiana, he had infinite expressions to deal with everything. If you were taking, eating too much, no prize in the bottom. Shut the door. You weren't born in the barn, were you? Don't act like you're hatched on a fence post in the sun. Oh, boy, that upset my brother. It didn't really upset me. All just this language kept pouring on you. And if you complained to him, he'd get out his invisible violin. He just had this kind of way with words. He was a wordsmith. He was gargarious. And he was, he didn't like Germans. And I had a really strong conflict with my father. So I was attracted to everything German. The Owl King being just the start of it. Then there was my mom. I so, I think I owe so much to the females in my life. But my mom, for some reason, when I got zero on my report card for spelling, zero, <laughs> thought she could redeem me, save me. I'll teach you how to spell. And every evening she'd place me on a chair and try to teach me how to spell. Well, she failed in that, but she made me fascinated and interested in words and what words could do. She had a very delicate relationship with words. She kept trying to tell me, you see, when you misspell a word, it's not the word you think it is anymore. You have to spell it correctly. She was a mathematician as well, and she felt the same thing about arithmetic. The numbers have to add up. If they don't, it's not beautiful. Then there was my grandmother, living in the same house, and she was the epitome of emotions. My mother was cool, my grandmother was hot. She would say things like, that's the end of the world. When, her, when we left the house and went somewhere else, that's the end of the world. She spoke like that. And she had real conflict between her, grand, between her husband and herself. And she once said to me, if you're a poet, you know your grandfather isn't. So all of that had a tension about it, a serious tension. One thing that happened was I didn't do well at school. I had dyslexia. I couldn't read what was on the blackboard. So that was another issue, and that's another reason why my mum tried to help me so much. I went to a library nearby. It was not a big library. And I was reading Nancy Drew mysteries and mysteries that teenagers usually read. But on the same shelf was Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, Schopenhauer. You need, these names mean something to people? Hegel, Rilke, they were all there. So you could just go along the shelf quite easily and slip from sensible literature into phenomenal literature. And I kind of was always leaning towards, oh, let's read that stuff that we're not supposed to read, you know. And one sign of that was when I was nine years of age, just nine, in my grandfather's workshop, somehow I sneaked downstairs and I managed to get into his cupboard that was locked. Now that seems important to me because that desire to know more really is deep in my psyche, to know more. 
and open that at nine years of age, even before you really have a chance to think about it. What did I see inside that cupboard? Dr. Calilleri's 1925, 29, sorry, expressionist film. I saw the horror. I saw pictures of the horror of the First World War, of the Holocaust, things I had never seen before. I don't recommend to mothers and fathers out there that you expose your children at nine years of age to horror, but I sought it. Do you understand? I went looking for it. I wanted to experience it. I wanted to experience what was beyond the door. That led to conflict, but my grandfather did not condemn me. He kind of, because he liked my courage to find out what was going on. Another occasion, by now I'm a teenager, he had a library. It was a narrow room, high ceiling, books right up to the ceiling. And I grabbed off the shelf Dante's Inferno. Dante? Dante's Inferno. Illustrated by Gustave Doré, a French 19th century illustrator. Really, really frightening images. And at the time, I had a job as a watchman in a house that was been requisitioned by the Department of Highways. So I was there on my own all night. And I read Dante's Inferno. Inferno hell, yes? And I fell asleep. And when I woke up, I knew I was being surrounded by evil, okay? I knew the presence of something demonic had been released by me reading this book. That's one thing I've understood, is you just can't read books. Sometimes they're more than that. Sometimes they're an experience that releases something. And I know I was somehow affected because when the next on the shift came, he looked at me and he said, are you all right? So I took that book and put it back on the shelf in the library and it stayed there. Was that a warning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Don't touch some things? Maybe. My grandfather could never accept the kind of meditation that I did. I did enormous periods of time I would just gaze and observe. So I would gaze at a flower for hours and he would say, don't waste your time. And my father would say, you don't even have the sense to come in out of the rain because I'd watch flowers in the rain and just the way the rain dropped on the petals, bing, bing, the sound the image, the yellow of daffodils with the rain falling on them. This kind of observation. Why was I doing it? Sitting in the woods all day, just listening and listening till the falling of a leaf sounded like thunder. It sounded like a thunderclap because you just had been there so long, so at peace, so quiet. And this is, of course, one of the things Muhammad Salam, praises as someone being absorbed in nature, being absorbed in the world, the living world around us. And I was drawn to that. And in my little book, my first poetic attempts, winter poems, there's a line that says, it's only motion that gives us away in the enchanted kingdom. That was very much a part of my life, was meditation. I went to Camp Artaban somewhere, it's a Christian camp, somewhere around being 11 and 12. I was put on by all the boys in the camp. 
I somehow was different, strange. I don't know exactly why, except that I wouldn't eat the porridge. I would not eat the porridge. It was horrid. Everyone else would eat the porridge. I would not eat the porridge. So they had to get cornflakes for me. And they hated me for it. I'll tell you, they hated me for it. Because I wouldn't give in. There it is again. Some kind of determination. But it was there that I had my first real experience that is otherworldly. How can I describe it to you? It's an open chapel in the summer. There's no roof on it. It's Christian, of course. The minister is in front. Everyone is bowing at this point in the service, looking down in prayer. And I won't. I keep my head up. I look over all these heads into the landscape beyond. And I see, please believe me when I tell you this, I see it absolutely transformed into a paradisatical beauty, into something just cannot be described. And that's one of the points in my life where I thought, I've got to try to describe this. I got to try to find a way of describing this. I rushed off to the minister to tell him what I had experienced, and he looked at me as the boy who wouldn't eat the porridge. He wasn't the slightest bit interested. So I learned two things. One, there are mystical experiences that don't easily fit into the pattern. And two, you might not be able to share them. It might be very hard to share them. As I was saying, I did, in the end, have conflict with all, with my father. He said, why don't you get a real job? That was his expression. My mom, she really disliked that I left Canada. So there was this tension. One of the things that happened, which was so dramatic in my life, Two things. One was I became an orderly in an intensive care unit in a major hospital. Now you have to remember all the time I'm reading and reading. But words on the page is one thing, but when you experience people dying every week and you're there and you're seeing it, it starts to demand that you do something. You have to resolve this in some way. You have to find a way to, to respond. So I write, and I start writing and writing. And I read the dictionary, because that's words. And my, my material is words. I also sadly fell in love with my next-door neighbor's wife, Sorry. And that was the burst of passion and disappointment and unrequited love that I needed to kind of crash through. Do you know what I mean? To just start to feel it in your heart so much. And what did I do? I got on a train and went 5,000 miles to the other side of the country with pounds, $70 in my pocket. And my first... Meal was five cents, a bowl that big of rice outside of the back of a Chinese restaurant. And I just lived there on the shoestring until someone had pity on me and gave me enough money to get back to England. Back to, <laughs> yeah, back to England. That's the way it gets all confused in my brain. Where am I? Canada? England? I was in Vancouver. Walking the beaches, you know, and trying to walk into the ocean to end it. That's how I felt, like I wanted to end this. And then I'd see the sun rise down the Fraser Valley, just this gold flowing, the rocky mountains rising up out of the mist. I thought, no, I don't want to end it. 
or great leaves coming down and fall, co covering me like an umbrella. I thought, I've got to try to express this. And, that would, and then I would recover again and again. When I was working in the hospital, I had moments that I can't explain. I stood beside this old man once, and the next day the head nurse said, you saved that man's life yesterday. This was just attention. This was just being beside him was enough. What was I reading? There's the question, isn't it? I was reading a lot of Zen poetry, Basho. The Tao Di Jin by Lao Zi. Okay? Taoism. The way is empty and use cannot drain it. The way is empty and use cannot drain it. So I was steeping myself, brewing myself in this mystical writing. At the same time, I was totally absorbed in Nietzsche and thus Bach Zarathustra, which is a philosophical book, but it's poetic at the same time. And the story of the mystic who comes down out of the mountain and tries to preach to the villagers, and a man is walking on a tightrope, and he falls. And the villagers don't know what to do. And Zarathustra picks him up on his arms like this and carries him back up the mountain to bury him with dignity. That was one of the, the kind of metaphors for my life. And here I was in this hospital caring for these people who all around me were perishing. So there was a great, again, friction going on between this mystical view, this vast open view, and this struggle to survive. Margaret Atwood, who I'm sure you all know, the Canadian novelist, poet, she wrote a book in 1973 called Survival. It was before, I didn't know about the book until the 1990s. Survival was trying to understand the English of America with the English of Canada with the English of Britain. And she came to the conclusion, and this is of course a generalization, that American literature is rags to riches, British literature is the castle. An Englishman's home is his castle. Canada's literature is survival. Survival. I felt years later when I began to write poems on the life of the Prophet Muhammad Salam, that he was in that position of survival. Surrounded by the Romans, the Quraysh, powerful enemies, he had to create a kingdom that could survive. But that instinct was in me. How do you survive? How do you survive against this nihilism? The books I was reading, for example, um, Stefan Wolf by Hermann Hesse, the German novelist, uh, and he won the Nobel Prize for Literature as well, had this incredible negativity. Yet something within the book was demanding that that person overcome the negativity. Without that, it would be hopeless. Another person I read a lot of was the German poet Rilke, sometimes called Rilke. I've heard it said called Rilke and heard him called Rilke. His elegies, I'll try to pronounce this as Italian, Dunio, Dunio. Elegies, written during the First World War, inspired me again and again in translation. His statement, 
every angel is terrible. Beauty is just the terror we are beginning to be able to endure. What does that mean? Every angel is terrible. And I just had to try to respond to that. So one autumn, about this time of the year, I began to just take long walks. I felt that was a response to the men and women dying in the hospital. I had to take walks. I had to walk and walk hundreds of miles. And on one of those walks, up the Bruce Trail, onto the Bruce Peninsula between Georgian Bay on one side, sorry, and Lake Huron on the other, a very narrow peninsula, very rough land, I met a woman and her husband, and she told me an Indian princess is buried near here. We wouldn't use the word Indian anymore. We say a First Nation princess. And I was intrigued, and I wanted to find this grave, the grave of a lost people, the Manitoulin tribe. I wanted to find it, just like I wanted to know what was beyond the door in my grandfather's workshop. I wanted to find that grave. But there was no signs pointing to it. It wasn't like a Roman runes. It was hidden somewhere out there. And I looked and looked for three days, and just when I was ready to give up, and the wind was increasing, and it looked like rain, I saw a butterfly flutter across the road in front of me. Just a long concession with specks of gravel on the grass, not, not tarmac. And I decided to follow that butterfly. And it led me to the grave of Nawi Bawikwe. And that began this book, The Seven Earth Odes that I worked on from 1972 to 2000 and got published in 2004. There it was, the truth, that revelation would happen and that would be the means for me to write. Any questions? Any questions at this time? Are you with me? Yes? I don't want to leave you behind. Um, and as you can understand, this isn't easy because there's so much going on, right? Uh, there's W.B. Yeats, the poet, his poetry, uh, the Irish poet. I read it so much that when I see the book, it's actually in pieces. I just read it and read it and read it until I didn't really understand. I just came to terms with it. I just accepted that a star on top of the tower is meaningful. I have no idea why it's meaningful at that time. I just love the idea of climbing that spiral staircase to the top of the tower and a star above. That was Yeats. And he was very influential in the moderns along with... Along with um, you know, Israel Pound, T.S. Eliot, I was reading all these people. So what was happening also was the First World War. I was reading, because maybe I opened that cupboard and saw what the First World War was in those images, that are not common images, I was drawn to those poets reacting to the First World War like Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon. Um, have you seen the film Benediction? Anyone watch that film? Right, it's very interesting. The first 45 minutes, after that, just turn it off. But the first 45 minutes are really wonderful, and especially the communications and conversations between Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon. I could so strongly identify when Wilfred Owen produces this little poem from behind the back, 
and says, you didn't like the one in the magazine. What about this one? Now, what comes out of that is that you speak straightforwardly. If you want, like my Sheikh said recently, Sheikh Muhammad said, those people who speak straightforward are telling you the truth. So to Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Festoon, there was not going to be any romanticizing of the First World War. They were going to say what it was and how terrible it was. And Wilfred Owen would die in the few remaining weeks before the armistice because he had to go back. He was in a mental hospital, recovering, and he decided to return. <clears throat> At the same time, of course, I've been influenced in the 1960s by the space odyssey, Stanley Kubek's amazing film, That Journey Again for the for the monolith, searching, going beyond the limits. When I was in England, now I'm in England, I have to remember, not in Canada, that's always my mind is going one way or the other. The only place I'm happy is mid-Atlantic. I came to Camp Hill. Camp Hill this was after the end of my walking, getting off the ship at Tilbury and just walking, walking, walking. I eventually came to the Lake District because that's where my grandfather said I should go. And I lived, I lived in Kendall. And I met people of Camp Hill. Camp Hill communities, anyone heard of them? They, are, um, they uh, specialize in caring for children with learning difficulties, adults with learning difficulties. And you live actually in the community. So they're called villagers or they're, called, they're residents. And you are a resident. So it's like work 24-7. You are all the time engaged with these kids, with these. And so I'm, what was so surprising to me was the beauty of this, of course, and the importance of the Arthurian legends to these people. And because of the kids, I remembered I just started to recite nursery rhymes. You know, like uh, the man in the moon came down too soon and asked which way to Norwich. He went by the south and burnt his mouth on supping cold peas porridge. Pretty absurd, isn't it? What does it mean? Boys and girls come out to play. The moon does shine as bright as day. Leave your supper and leave your sleep. Join your friends in the street. You bring water and I'll bring flour and we'll have pudding in half an hour. For a Canadian, this was all very, very strange. Hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one, hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran down again. All these, I repeated over and over, so I just got a great feeling for the rhythms of these kind of nursery rhymes, the, the, these fairy tales that the kids loved. So I spent a lot of time <laughs> doing that, and I completely lost touch with my own poetry. I started to write in a 19th century way with the Indian ink pen and journals, which my grandfather loved as when he lived at home uh, because his mother, wife had passed away and he was approaching his own death. And he just loved to pour over these journals that I had written. In the midst of all this, at a certain point, I went to Faroe in the North Sea. I guess everyone's heard of the Fair Isle on the, um, you know, uh, the radio, um, the lighthouse reports. Fair Isle is between Orkney and Shetland. I lived there for 10 months in a hut that was held down by an iron cable. Here I am again, you see, on the edge. And I got to the sea, of course, sat on a rock, watching the waves come in until one wave hit right at my feet and just like bullets, you know. The spray just covered me. And when I told my, uh, the person I was staying with or who had let me stay in a place called the hut, he said, you could have been killed. Yep. I kept wondering, how is it that I'm always pushing myself somehow? Why is it, you know? Why am I pushing, pushing to get to some other place? That yearning. 
It's a beautiful sense in, in Rilke and Rumi that the love of God is in the yearning for God. Right? It's not in the achievement. It's in that yearning. It's in that worship. It's in that prayer. And Pharaoh was amazing on this rock, watching the waves, or just seeing a storm come from across the Atlantic Ocean. You know, the, the clouds marshalling as it, as it approached. Or the rain coming down, and you think you're inside a cave with all these stigmatites coming down. It's rain, you know. You can see in a distance approaching. And the northern lights, of course, just rushing up into the sky and kind of blooming right over your head. Well, this was so inspiring. But when I read the poetry I wrote there, it's as wooden as old turnips. It really is. It's terrible. Sorry. But it is. And I managed to salvage some of the lines and works and then they got published in this book, The New and Selected Poems. So eventually, I did manage to turn some of these radical experiences into, into poetry. But I also became very political in the 1980s. And I read people like E.P. Thompson's Making of the English Working Class, a remarkable book, um, to understand what is the English working class, because that term meant nothing to me as a Canadian. And also Fanton's Wretched of the Earth and the Politics of Latin America. I want to go back a little bit before I go forward and say when I came to this country, I dissolved that I was going to read as many English epics as I could. So I read Paradise Lost, I read Chaucer, uh, The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer, these long, long poems. And this way I brewed myself and became engrossed with English writing. And that was important to me. And then I met David Jones, the Welsh poet of the 20th century, writing in Parnassus about the First World War and the Atamatata, if I pronounced it correctly, um, which took me three years to read. And his mixing of Welsh mythology and the First World War or his Roman Catholicism and mythology all was intriguing to me in what is going on, you know? How is, does that work? So my spirituality was also being inspired by Greek mythology, Norse mythology, the mythology of the Hindus, the mythology of Japan, all these, as well as the same time I was drifting in through Christianity towards Islam. I went to university in 1994 as a very mature student, as you can imagine. I learned things there that over all my writing I had not understood. One was post-colonialism. I didn't realize I was brought up in a colony. I didn't realize Canada was a colony. I didn't realize how that influenced my thinking, why I was so focused on Europe and not on my homeland. Why was I so Eurocentric? So when I read people like Derek Wilcott of the Caribbean and his epic Omerus, which I couldn't put down. I realized this was another, this was the periphery speaking to the center. And was I on the periphery? Yes. Yes, we didn't learn Canadian literature very much at school. But there was Canadian literature. And I began to have this image of two gardens, the garden in Europe and the garden in Canada. It might be a bit rough garden, but I want to know about it. I want to know about my garden. So that was a breakthrough for me. Another breakthrough was women's studies. I've always felt that I had a poor relationship with females. And I wanted to change that. So I studied women in the family. I was only the second man in the group. And the years between the wars, and I learned a lot. I somehow took my emotions 
and learn what it was to be a woman. And that's very significant in the poems, The Life of the Prophet Muhammad, because they inspired me. I just got to get this. Because I was inspired by the female companions' narratives, their accounts, and describing the intimacy between them and Muhammad and their different perspective is very much one of the inspirations behind this book. The other thing that was very important for me was literary criticism. I had never had any tools in which to analyze my own writing. Literary criticism gave me tools to analyze other writings. Why were they deficient? Why didn't I like that? But also, what about my writing and representation, how you represent people, how you use your words to convey an image about another human being. Imagine writing about Muhammad, how do you do that? After my university and during my university, my Christianity suffered. <clears throat> my spiritual side suffered because I just had to work so hard to get a decent grade. In fact, I got a first. In fact, they gave me a prize for being the highest grade in humanities. And I lost a lot of my spirituality in that process. In 2004, I was living in Lincoln. I was a literature development officer in the county. And now I was made redundant and I became freelance. And I had this book, The Seven Earth Odes, published. And this book, The Holy Week Sequence, published. Yet in the same year, I was going to become a Muslim. How did that happen? Well, Afifa Amatala, my wife, I hope she'll forgive me to mention her name in public, but we have talked about this. She was a catalyst. On the same day, we met in the middle of Lincoln three times by accident. I said, I'm reading the Seven Earth Odes tonight at the Spec Bookshop. Hope you can come. She came and she sent me an email afterwards saying, you've always been a Sufi. So this book connects me to the poems of the life of the Prophet Muhammad But as soon as I became a Muslim, and I became a Muslim through the intervention of Sheikh Nazim, Alakani, Allah bless his soul, what happened was as soon as my wife-to-be came into my life, Sheikh Nazim entered my heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? He became a guide for me. He became a presence. I can verify that by an experience I had where I was seeing a counselor or a therapist because I had some difficult relationships. And the therapist said to me, the woman, you don't need to come anymore. And I thought, I've offended another one. She said, no, you have a presence beside you. So there was a woman who didn't seem to be a, a woman of faith, but she was allowed to sense this presence. We went to Cyprus where Sheikh Nazim lived. And my wife said to, to be said to me, if this man doesn't accept you, I don't know what we can do with our relationship. Now, I wasn't used to this kind of thinking. I was used to, if I want something, I try to get it. I don't really think someone else should tell me what I should do. Very selfish, individualistic, North American, drive your car at 100 miles an hour, turn the corner, you know, do the wild thing, walk on the wild side. But I had to listen, and I did. And he came up to me and he pinched my cheek. He said, if you weren't good enough, I wouldn't let you marry my precious daughter. 
Some, and a man came up to me afterwards and said, there's been people coming here for 20 years and he hasn't pinched their cheek. All this was quite a surprise to me, but I just began writing and writing about this experience. This experience of being with the Nachabandi brothers who come from around the world to visit their sheikh in Cyprus, come from Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, the United States. I was dumbfounded. But actually, there was just a time in the 1990s when I was a freelance tutor working in the University of York and the professors gave me Islamic students to work with. And I marveled that they acknowledged Allah on their thesis, on their dissertations. They acknowledged him. And I thought, that's how it should be. That's what you should be doing. You should be acknowledging the creator. And they did. I forgot afterwards, but then now I remember. Now I remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was dropping those seeds dropping those stones in the water for me to step on, the next one, the next one, or my love for the Prophet by Cahill Cabran Cahill, or, or the Rubiat by Omar Khayyam, well, many Rubi over Omar Khayyams probably. And isn't it interesting how he did that, how Allah sort of got people thinking about Islam before they knew it? Because he got that book translated by a man called Edward Fitzgerald, finding the uh, manuscript in, uh, the, in a famous library in uh, Oxford. A man called Colville, a stout Christian, gave it to Edward Fitzgerald and he translated it. But until Tennyson acknowledged Edward Fitzgerald, who he called Fitz, no one knew about it. No one knew about the Rubaiyat till then. And when they found out, it became famous. So people were reading Islam without knowing it. You see what I mean? If they had known it was Islam, they probably would have rejected it. But they didn't know. And so this is how, in my opinion, subtly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works to bring about what he wants. And he doesn't need to have, he doesn't need an editor. He doesn't need someone to look at his template and judge it. He acts. And without his action, I would not be standing here now. Or without his action, I would never have become a Sufi Muslim. But, as soon as I did become one, all I wanted to do was write about it over and over again. And that's something called Sufi storybook. It might be published someday. I don't know. It's all these crazy stories of what happened to me in Cyprus. Um, he was very impressed when I cleaned the male guest house. I cleaned it. I'd learned how to clean being, an or being um, uh, working in the Castle Museum in York in another incarnation. And so I cleaned this place exquisitely, I guess. And he thought that was wonderful. And my wife said, you know, he liked that. But when it came to our marriage, I couldn't pronounce the name he gave me. He gave me the name Abdul Wadud. I couldn't pronounce it. So he gave me another name, Ibrahim. I couldn't pronounce that. So then he gave up. <laughs> it's fascinating that years before, he had given to Afifa the zikr of Yahweh dude. 500 Yahweh dudes a day. And as soon as he, the, the Murads turned to the sheikh and said, what name are you going to give this guy? He said, Abdul Wadud. That's the way sheikhs work, like lightning. They don't contemplate it. They don't add it up. They just, bing. See what I mean? And it's amazing when you experience it. 
In 2006, I actually spent time with Sheikh Murad and his family, with my wife, in Istanbul. And that was wonderful too. Walking the streets of the city with Sheikh Murad, Abdul Hakim Murad, and him with his knowledge, pointing out the mosque, pointing out, look at these stones here. See, people walked on this threshold using their right foot first. See how it's warped on the right-hand side rather than the left-hand side? Putting your right foot forward first before you enter the mosque. Being in the Sulamandi, um, uh, the blue mosque, I loved it. It was wonderful. I wrote about it all. I loved the idea of the Greeks being there too in Byzantine, all this mix of cultures. This is what I wanted. I wanted all these cultures to be together. I wanted to write about that. I went on Hajj in 2006 and I was very ill. In fact, at those days, I was quite often ill. And I don't know why, but I was. And there was more intense spiritual experiences and I got them all written down in notes and every once in a while I think I'm going to start writing them out, but I haven't yet. But they're all there, all these notes of everything I experienced. How many of you have been on Hajj? Mashallah. Transforming experience, absolutely transforming. Um, you're, there you are, in the land of Muhammad Salam. You're there. And it just has an effect on you. Has an effect on you to see his tomb. Has an effect on you to... Um, sleep in the desert with all these millions of people. I mean, I don't know if I could recommend that to anyone. Uh, is there a way we could do that here? I don't know. What do they think? Close the M25 and I'll just sleep on the M25 for a night. Similar, isn't it? <laughs> the ground is not that harder. Much, yeah, it's just slightly harder on the M25 than the desert in Saudi Arabia, but not much harder. And then you have all these little kiosks, you know, trying to sell you tea. And there's these white piles of little plastic teacups, you know, just white piles of them. And then you have these, you have these toilets over here on the side. And you have way long queues for them. Oh, my goodness. It was a wonderful experience. One of the moments was that really uh, excited me was when I was uh, minding my own business, making voodoo, and suddenly a shot of water went right straight through my cubicle like that. Someone had just turned the tap and it sheared off. <laughs> uh, just amazing stuff happened. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, my wife says to me all the time that um, you said you weren't going to do this. Like go to the, do Tawawe around the um, Tuaf. Tuaf, sorry, around the, the Kaaba. Tuaf. Oh no, I can't do it anymore. I've had enough of that. So I end up doing it and then getting, touching the Kaaba door, you know. I'm reaching out like this and a black hand takes hold of me and goes whack right against the door. <laughs> and I turn around and see my wife and just, her glasses are like this, you know. <laughs> it is an aggressive experience. Uh, it's very assertive, you know, people throwing stones. It's, it's quite amazing. Uh, we went with a small group. A guy called Haji Gama, Haji, we called him Haji Master. He had a lovely story. The first time he went on Hajj 39 years ago, and afterwards he went on Hajj every year since, he said, I went there and I just didn't have the heart to go and, you know, see Muhammad Salaam, in his tomb. I, I, just, I just couldn't do it. And for a couple of nights he just slept. And then he felt a pinch on his toe. You've come here, and you're not going to see me? Well, that did it. He's gone every time since now. So they, why, how do these real experiences happen? You know, why does someone have that experience? It's, it's a mystery to me. Um, by 2008, I decided that the answer, I just had to worship more, and I just did. I did so lot. Uh, salawats, more and more salawat, more and more salawat, more and more worship, to get away from the nihilism, to get away from the negativity, more and more worship, no end to it. And the goal is not 
the end, the goal is the worship itself. There's an amazing story I heard recently that a Rumi says that a man was praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of course Shaitan came along and said, what are you praising him for? There's no goal in this, you'll never achieve anything. So he stopped. And then Allah sent an angel to him and said, why did you stop? Well, there's no end, to, you know, there's no outcome, there's no fulfillment. He said, your yearning was fulfillment. Your longing was fulfillment. So we mustn't lose faith if we think, oh, I've been worshipping like this day in, day out. What have I got? you got something. Don't worry, you got something. In around 2009 and 10, I met the Nachabandi Asalam. Do you know the Nachabandi Asalam? They wear white crowns. And they're all in white. Um, they do marches. I joined their marches in Peterborough, Leeds, um, Blackburn, especially in Peterborough. One of them, Sufi Nadim, I spent Ramadan with him. And here again, where does this stop, this mystical experience? Right now I'm trying to do something. I'm trying to send out what was given to me by this man, Sufi Nadim, to you. It's called the heart's zikr. It's something he did to my heart that makes it different than it was before. What does that mean? I just had to write about it and gradually became clear to me that I had to read about this. Read about Muhammad because he, alayhi salatu was the source of this. He was the one who came down from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and started this. What was his life like? Why did he do these things? Who was he? So that began my quest to write this book, though I didn't know that would, where it would end. I read books like Martin Ling's Mohammed, based on earliest historical records. Totally recommend it. Amazing. Um, to get to the details because that's what modern writing to me is about, is getting the details down. Whether it's Wilfred Owen in the First World War, whatever it is, is those details. And not being generalistic, but actually specific. And that was great. Also a book by um, Sheikh Hisham Kabani um, that he created with his wife, based upon the accounts of the female companions. I found that incredibly inspiring, and there's lots of poems in here relating to the female opinion. The slave girl, Aisha, Hassas, can't pronounce her name properly. The conflicts between them I found fascinating. I used concrete poetry in one of them to describe the ball that Aisha threw across the room when Muhammad والسلام, was praising the food that Hassa, Hassa, Hassa had given him. And he went, shoo, crash. And then, of course, Aisha immediately regretted it. And she said, how can I replace this? What can I do? She said, it's irreplaceable. Irreplaceable. So that was... One of the sources, there's also a website called the Islamic State, which is not anything to do with the paramilitary group. It's descriptions of the early uh, kingdom of, uh, and Muhammad's actions. The way, for example, alayhi salam, Rasulullah. The way he handled issues about water and tried to make sure everyone had sufficient water how he um, organized it so that travelers would have food, have, a, have something to eat if they came, to care about travelers. He called himself a wayfarer who belongs to no one. He was an orphan. Think of it. An orphan 
in such a hierarchical society. You know, he had no strong links of family or blood relations. And he went up into that cave over and over again, waiting for what? Without a Quran, without wudu, just there. And that's in here, the cave, the cave uh, contemplations. But the um, Nachabandi Asalam were very important to me. But my wife couldn't stand it because I just spent so much time away from her that she said, I'm going to divorce you if you don't leave those guys behind. So there you are. So I did. Um, and came back to my senses for a while, at least. Um, Classical Islam is another book I highly recommend. Um, and of course, the writings of Sheikh Nazi Malakani, Allah bless his soul, um, Mercy Oceans. I love the idea of the ocean being full of mercy and this wave after wave coming on you. Um, all this was necessary. Um, also, I'm a, I'm a contemporary writer and I use free form to work with these poems. But I also use refrain in others. Um, this poem here, An Unknown, was one of the most significant transforming points for me because I realized how much of a radical Muhammad salam, is was, understand, he laid down in this man's grave and then said, now you can bury the body. Can you imagine laying down in your friend's grave? He did things that no one else did. I found that amazing. Now you have to picture me after Ramadan and each day after Tuawe going out to my shed and it being faced with a blank paper. I don't know. Do you know what a blank paper You know what blank paper's like, I guess, don't you? There you are. See? Blank paper. And I just told myself, you have to fill that about Muhammad, alayhi salatu salam, and don't leave this building until you do. That's just about how I spoke to myself, and I just shook at times trying to get the words out. And that's what I suppose is mysterious that for a period of time I could do it. But like I said to some here already, when the period of time was over, there was no way back. I'd been on that island, I'd left it, I turned around and the island had vanished. There was no way back to writing like that again. And I've written um, about Islam. I'm still inspired by all aspects of Islam, but I, I don't write about Muhammad alayhi salam. In a way, you can understand it because he is such a, a pure being. You have to have permission. You have to feel that permission to be able to, to, to try to describe him. Um, amazingly, there's a thousand copies sold of the book, and we're in our second edition. The book's for sale in Singapore. There's talk of doing it, published in, in Pakistan, Karla, India. A young man in Bangladesh asked me to send it by electronic version because he couldn't, he couldn't um, purchase it. He wants to annotate the book and connect all these stories to hadiths, Quranic writing, and so on. He wants to do all that. That's, that's possibly amazing. I have, pub I have uh, finished a novel called Sometimes the Police Are Friendly. And it's a story about a man who's been trapped in prison for a day because he did something he shouldn't have, but he didn't do what he, they thought he had done. But he added it up that all the bad things he'd done in his life meant that he deserved to be in uh, prison for a day, but not for what they said he had done, because he didn't. So there's that aspect to it. But being there, he starts to unravel his life. And he, what does he find? Yeah, what does he ask for? 
Say, oh, sir, would you like some supper? Would you like some dinner? No, I want a prayer mat. So he's given a prayer mat. And on that prayer mat is like a flying carpet. And he goes all over the place in his life. And he sees on the wall a red streak for Qibla. Someone had been there before. You know, like the Passover, where there's the blood mark on the, on the doors where the angel of death should pass over. This was this red mark on the wall. So he goes on a journey of self-discovery, but it's really based upon worship, prayer, zikr. And I'm looking for an agent, a publisher. If anyone's interested, speak to me later or send me an email. I have these, uh, another collection of mystical poems in and out of worlds and Sufi storybook. And something I've been writing ever since my wife got angry with me for over something years ago, began to write something I call the Sufi's dustbin. And these are four line poems, now 400 of them, waiting to be printed out or typed out or something. They're still in long hand. <laughs> but that's where it all starts. Like, WB8 said, uh, the uh, rag and bone shop of the heart, the rag and bone shop of the heart. But what wonderful expressions uh, Muhammad Salam said, and one of the ones that I try to live by and stick to is, the best of you are the kindest to women. And this book is also meant to be another reminder of that, to try to encourage Muslim men uh, to value their wives, their sisters, their mothers um, more than we do. Once uh, Muhammad alayhi salam was um, uh, with, a, with a sahaba, and the sahaba said, well, look, look, uh, master, uh, you're not sitting up high on a chair. People come, they don't know who's Muhammad. What's going on here? You know, you just get visitors and you're just amongst them. We don't know. He said, my, wa- my mother ate dried fish too. So he had that wonderful humility, um, and, and that's the way he wanted it to be. And when his horses were always winning races, and then finally he lost, and everyone, all the Sahaba said, that shouldn't happen, you should win all races. He turned to them and said, anything that is raised in this world, Allah will lower it. Even him, he'll lower. Like I said about W.B. Yeats, um, when I look at his selected poems and book I bought years and years ago, it's just in tatters. My desperation to try to understand came at last to come to terms with it. Um, poetry, as T.S. Eliot and many have said, has numerous meanings. Another one of my experiences is you're responding to the poem before you realize you're responding. Even if you're closing the book, you're responding. You understand what I'm saying? So it's gibberish. Probably very few things are really gibberish, you know, if it's got to the point of being published. Um, But understanding is very complex because it's based also on your experiences. Um, I don't know what to recommend except that you will, in your reading, you will find things that do make sense, are powerful, and are affecting you. And when that happens, grab hold of it, you know? Grab hold of it and run with it. And you'll learn from that how to deal with other things that don't make sense so much. Also, you just I just had to be patient. There was times when I didn't understand things, of course. Um, and as you know, you, went, you go to school and you're learning Shakespeare. Well, thank you very much. What does that mean? You know, Hamlet, tell me, what about it? What does it mean? You know, but eventually you begin to understand what it means. You go through life experiences, you know what that betrayal is, you know how hard you can feel, or Macbeth, you know, you, and, but part of that was reading it not as a child, not as a teenager, but reading it as a, as a choice, you know, as an adult. 
saying, I want to read this. I want to feel this. Um, and, and that can be quite powerful. You could say that uh, poetry is wasted on the young <laughs> because I, I know a lot of young people are attracted to it. But And then they say, oh, I get old, older and I don't need poetry. You know, poetry is for the young. But for me, it's, it's just been a life journey and um, I'm willing to take the time to value things that are difficult. You know, um, reading the Atomatita by David Jones, taking five, three years to read it. You know, just going over those phrases again and again. And, and this book here has phrases in it that have been rewritten a hundred times. You know, 32 years between the conception, if you like, and the publication. So it's, it's a complex issue. But I do think you shouldn't become bogged down in a book. If it's not doing anything for you, move on and come back to it when you know more or uh, when you have an experience that actually, oh, i got to deal with that now. I think one of the things I've noticed is that there is a desire from cultures who have come to England. Um, two things, I think. One is, yes, assimilation understanding English literature. But the other is a re-emergence of understanding your own literature. The first generation wanted to assimilate, but gradually further generations want to know where they come from. Where, who am I? So I'd almost recommend that you reconnect with that culture that's behind you. Um, where, where is your ancestry from? Pakistan? There are many poets there, great poets, ancient and present, and maybe that's where you should start. Some of that is very modern, affected by English poetry. I must, I must say that, you know, brought up as I was with my grandfather, I, I feel I had a terrific advantage because he legitimized poetry to me. He legitimized that I should read it and that I should take time to write it, that it was legitimate, that it was valid to do that. But the act of reconnecting, I don't know. You have to, you know, you pray. You could ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you reconnect with poetry. You could just force yourself to reconnect with it, doing it over and over again until you actually feel more. The thing with poetry is it's, it's not like a novel where you're trying to get from the beginning to the end. I know there are pages in a novel you want to read over again, but poetry kind of demands that you read, over, read it over again. Three times at least, and try to feel it. Try to find what is the block, what's preventing you from accessing this. Does that help at all? That's, that's the, yeah, I, you see, it's a very difficult question because it's a very personal thing. You could be... Uh, misguided by school or education in the wrong direction to what you really are interested in. So you have to read around. That's what I found. So I was very interested in miniature poems from the haiku of Japanese and Chinese poetry. And I found that intriguing. But that wasn't what you were learning at school. I never was really inspired by British poets the same way as I was inspired by translations into English. And I realized now that was because, for one reason at least, I wasn't, I didn't know Canadian, see? Instead of gravitating towards Britain, I gravitated towards translation, something that was just not quite British, something off at the periphery, off-center. Um, 
So that might help you to actually explore around and see what really does work for you. Something will, I'm sure, if you persist with it. I depend upon following that butterfly uh, and, and revelation. And I try not to back away from that. I try not to say, oh, I can't write about it, or all the negativities that come up, you know, or oh, it's been said better by someone else before me, and or oh, what are you writing about that for? I try to trust as much as I can what I, what's inspiring me, what's moving me, because it's so risky to get outside of that territory. Even novelists will say to you, write about what you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is fascinating to use your imagination. I mean, in this book, I had to use my imagination. How was I going to go back 1,400 years um, or connect, as one of the poems there, to, to necklaces? But also, um, you know, in uh, the new and selected poems, it takes years sometimes to do justice to an event. You know, one event. The poet Rilke, we mentioned before, Rainer Marina Rilke, died in 1926, said, once you have experienced your childhood, you can write about it for the rest of your life. That's enough. You don't need any more than that because it's so compact, it's so much in there that actually taking it apart is, is enormously difficult. Um, I mean, there's different points of inspiration, isn't there? One is theory, like literary theory, and just saying, oh, I, I want to follow that theory through, you know. Post-colonial, for example. I'm a post-colonial. I want to understand that. I want to write out of that. But then there's the heart as well. What really moves you? And understanding what really moves you. And paying attention to it. And not being distracted. You know, like you probably know Edward Said and uh, Orientalism. Uh, 1978, and this was very true of Canada as well. You know, you don't write about um, snow, you write about spring. My grandfather wanted me to write about spring in Canada, where spring is about three weeks between winter and summer sometimes. I wanted to write about the snow <laughs> and the ice, you know, the crystal ponds. But there he was. There was an example of Orientalism. So you've got to get through those kind of prejudices that are armed against you. You can't escape them. You've got to get through them. So that's one thing to consider. The other thing to consider is what, you know, some things are so painful that people can't write about them. But actually that's the source of great writing, is having the courage to go into that space where it really hurts, whether it's rejection, where it's uh, uh, poverty maybe, or illness, you know, from a, a loved one. and But you have to, to some extent, keep it to yourself. You can't necessarily go to the hospital and say, Dad, I wrote this poem about you, about you dying. You know, it, you know, the temptation to do that sort of thing. But you have to keep it here. You know, it's like Wilfred Owen behind, had the poem behind his back. What do you think of this? It's, it is secretive. It is kind of inner. And you're working on those inner experiences. And you have to be, when it goes from the private domain into the public domain, this is a kind of another transformation that takes place. And you have to be aware of that. You know, you, you, you read it to people, but you're cautious. Does that help at all? Uh, yeah, dyslexia can be a, a killer because you you know driving in the middle of the night looking for the A46 and you desperately turn it into the A64 because that's what you really want. Um, yes, this is one of the things that I uh, have to say that words were a struggle for me. Um, so that's part of the the energy is coming to try to solve that problem. Um, but that meant I read slowly, um, so I wasn't reading at a pace. I just had to read carefully. So then I was looking at the words and I was foregrounding, to use that word. I was emphasizing the structure of the words, not only, uh, not solely the meaning of the words or the, the images it sets off in your uh, inner, in, internal mind, you know. I was reading it for the structure, the con 
the creation, the construct of the words. So yes, that was one of the reasons why I guess I became uh, a poet um, rather than a novelist uh, because it was so hard. Words were so hard. And I would read some of my stuff I wrote at that time. Some of the lines are going this way because I'm left-handed. Some of the lines are going that way. <laughs> I couldn't do that now. <laughs> and every once in a while you'd see these beautiful flowing long lines, you know, of uh, letters, big letters going along. So I was, handwriting was very important, a part of this experience of, um, of overcoming dyslexia was handwriting. And seeing what made words work, you know, prefixes, suffixes, all these things, um, they helped. But I also recognized that part of uh, dyslexia was my, part of it, was my creativity. Dyslexia was my uh, uh, deficiency. Was in sp was part of what was making me a writer. Was making me creative. Was that I saw things differently, you know. And my wife has got a book of my spoonerisms, and oh, I'm saying it all the time. Let's lemonize, you know. It, it just comes out over and over again. She just looks at me. What are we going to talk about? You know, it's just. <laughs> I can't stop it. You haven't heard many today yet, I hope. But uh, this is dyslexia. And, and one of the things, of course, if anyone who's got an ailment is to try to look at it positively, see how it's benefiting you and not let it overwhelm you, not let it become something so negative. But at first it was very negative for me. I was struggling all the time against my unable to pronounce certain words in Shakespearean plays. Mavolio, I couldn't pronounce it properly. So everyone in the class laughed, you know. So I suffered. I, I suffered all that. When I loved the subject, I suffered this humiliation, you know. Um, but I had my experiences as well. When, for example, my, my friends we were playing football, Canadian football, we'd throw the ball down the field, and it was getting near twilight, and they said to me, what do those clouds look like? And I said, like swordfish, and that silenced them completely. So, you know, again, what isolates you from other people can be very creative. Okay, thank you very much. Assalamu uh, alaikum, and we're going to bring this to a close now. Um, I really enjoyed speaking to you. Uh, this was the A side of the record. If you want the B side, um, buy one of my buy the poems, uh, the new and selected poems. That's got the B side.